welcome back to another episode of Don't Make Me Watch That. This week, we're going to compare the movie career of Ryan Reynolds to the television career of Ted McGinley. You'd be surprised at the similarities you're going to see. But first, I want to remind you, subscribe to my channel, ring the bell to stay informed, and let me know what you think in the comments section below of this show. Are you a fan of Ryan Reynolds? Are you a fan of Ted McGinley? Once again, let me know in the comments below. And now, let's begin. It might be hard to believe, but Ryan Reynolds was once struggling to gain a foothold as a movie star. He would be brought aboard a franchise as that franchise was on its last legs, which is the same thing that happened to Ted McGinley on television. McGinley, in fact, came to be known of as the patron saint of shark jumping because he always seemed to be brought on board a franchise as its creative juices were starting to wane. For those who don't know what it means to jump the shark, here's a brief explanation. The television series Happy Days had an episode that was considered the series low point and the beginning of the end for the show at least creatively. It's the episode where Fonzie had to water ski over a live shark. It happened in the fifth season episode, Hollywood Part 3. John Hain would coin the phrase to mean a show that was washed up creatively, but still continued, usually replacing a main cast member with someone that was not as popular, like when Welcome Back Carter replaced John Travolta with Stephen Shortage, who himself has been mistaken for Ted McGinley. That's right, Ted McGinley did not replace John Travolta on Welcome Back Carter. Let's take a look at the two's careers, then compare compare and contrast. Ironically, the first show that McGinley replaced a main character on was Happy Days, where the phrase Jump the Shark was coined. When Ron Howard left the series after season seven, McGinley came on board as Marion's nephew, Roger Phillips. Have a seat. Sit down. Fonzie, if you don't mind, I'll handle this. Hey, I'm on your turf. Sure. The show ended its three-year stint in the top five and had dropped to number 17 in the ratings. It limped along until 1984, ending its 10-year run at number 63 in the ratings as it failed to survive the onslaught of NBC's The A-Team. And let's face it, Roger Phillips was just Richie Cunningham light. No one seemed to bother to build a separate character for Roger. He just seemed to be there and to replace Richie. And now we look at Ryan Reynolds. In the cinematic counterpart to Jumping the Shark, he would come on board the Blade franchise in the third installment, Blade Trinity. Um, he'll help here. And although his version of Hannibal King was actually one of the highlights of the film, its star, Wesley Snipes, seemed tired of the role that made him the first African-American actor to adopt a Marvel character and franchise. Take a look at this. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Wesley Snipes would become difficult to work with, and director David S. Goyer didn't particularly get along with the star, which is quite an understatement if you know the history of those two. We're not going to discuss that here. That's for another show. The film didn't exactly bomb, but was a disappointment at the box office, making $52 million in North America compared to the $70 million take of the first film and the $82 million take of the second film. The Blade series ended with Ryan Reynolds' first foray into the franchise. <laughs> This is awkward. Now we're back to Ted McGinley. After Happy Days went off the air, Ted went on to do a tour on the love boat as Ashley Ace Covington Evans, photographer. His tenure once again lasted about 60 episodes in the last three seasons of that series as he replaced Lauren Twos. After McGinley came on board, the ratings to the show would drop more each year. Now let's look at Ryan Reynolds again. He would join the cast of one of the longest running and most popular franchises in the history of cinema as he would portray Wade Wilson in X-Men Origins Wolverine. Great. Stuck in an elevator with five guys on a high protein diet. Oh, Wade. Dreams really do come true. So just shut it! You're up. The box office for this film would fare far better than Blade Trinity as it brought in just under $180 million domestic. However, this was far below what X-Men 3 The Last Stand brought in and was the first X-Men film to make less than its predecessor. Fans were also upset with the treatment of the wisecracking Deadpool characters as they silenced him by removing his mouth. Yeah, Striker finally figured out how to shut you up. Which is especially tragic when you consider that Ryan Reynolds has been praised for his comic timing and you look at the writers of the characters in the comic book. Of course, Reynolds would successfully revisit the character, more on that later. But back to Ted McGinley. His next foray into series television would be as Clay Felamont on Dynasty, joining the series in 1986 and lasting for 36 episodes, far less than Happy Days or Love Boat. And he didn't technically replace anybody on that show, but the show was starting to wane in the ratings the year he came aboard. Again, not necessarily his fault. Why jump to conclusions? Maybe this happened during a more intimate type adventure. 
pretty wild. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm Clay Foma. It dropped from number 7 in 1986 to number 24 in 1987. Going back to Ryan Reynolds, he finally got to play the lead in a superhero movie as DC wanted to launch Reynolds as Hal Jordan in its Green Lantern franchise, and the movie started off doing great box office in its first week, but petered out by the end of its run, earning $116 million domestic against a $200 million budget. Oh, green! Wow. I know, right? It seemed that Reynolds was destined to fail at superhero movies. But now back to Ted McGinley. Finally, the curse of the dreaded shark jump was over as McGinley joined the cast of Married with Children, again replacing a well-liked character as David Garrison left the Steve Rhodes character behind. But here it was different. I wouldn't mind having a woman as president, especially if it was you, Marcy. Because I'd make a great first lady. McGinley's Jefferson Darcy character was a degenerate lowlife compared to Steve's everyday neighbor type, who was whipped by Marcy. Jefferson wasn't a whipping post to Amanda Beer's character. No, I'm not okay. Look, Marcy, I'm a man. I have needs. I am tired of everyone else having sex but me. And he was just as degenerate as Ed O'Neill's Al Bundy, giving the neighbors more contrast. He also caused Marcy's name to be Marcy Darcy. He was in a bona fide hit and outlasted Steve's character by several years. You mean he tied you up and smeared you with marshmallow fluff? Well, that is sick. Yeah. <laughs> Pervert. Unlike Steve, Jefferson is an unemployed lazy loafer who takes advantage of Marcy for financial purposes. This makes him different than the character that he replaced, which was not the case in the other shows where he replaced a well-liked character. He lasted 167 episodes compared to Steve 79. The ratings would jump from number 50 in season 5 to number 29 in season 6, its highest rated season through its 11-year run. Finally, Ted McGinley wasn't just replacing a liked character with a blandly written offshoot. He became more popular than the one he replaced. And back to Ryan Reynolds. You all know what happened after Green Lantern failed to ignite the superhero world. Reynolds got to return to the character of Deadpool, and this time do it right. Balls did I have to fondle to get my very own movie. I can't tell you, but it does rhyme with Pulverine. The franchise started with a bang, and unlike the unrecognizable character that was called Deadpool in X-Men Origins, this Deadpool was based directly on the comic book, and Ryan Reynolds' sharp tongue was put to good use. Really? Rolling up the sleeves? I may be super, but... <laughs> I am no hero. Fans of Reynolds were happy, and fans of the comic book character cheered. Ted McGinley and Ryan Reynolds were both involved with franchises that jumped the shark, and both finally found the success that they deserved, since both are very talented comedic actors. One more geared towards television, and the other towards the cinematic universe. And that's our look at Ted McGinley and Ryan Reynolds. Did you agree with my assessment? Do you think Ryan Reynolds is the Ted McGinley of cinema? Do you like Ted McGinley's performances? Do you like Ryan Reynolds' performances? Performances. Do you have a favorite from each? List it in the comments section below. And one uh, franchise I forgot to mention for Ted McGinley, which went from movie theaters to television, was the Revenge of the Nerds movies. But I'm all out of time now. We're going to talk about Revenge of the Nerds on a later episode. Until next time, this is Kevin Gibbons saying so long, live long and prosper, may the force be with you, keep reading comic books, listening to rock and roll, and watching those pop culture icons. I want to remind you that if you love comics and pop culture as much as I do, you'll subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to stay informed of upcoming videos. Please share this video as that will help me gain subscribers as well. I also want to remind you to check out my columns and reviews on two sites, Comics for Sinners and Comic Crusaders. I also have my own franchises, Adolescent Radioactive Samurai Platypi and Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter. The latter has been picked up by Cutthroat Comics. Check the links below for more details and the link to Dracula Rising, which is available on Amazon. Here's some great artwork from Raphael Lanohaus from the origin story Foul Blood. Once again, available on Cutthroat Comics. See the links below. I also have a book which is a collection of my reviews and columns called Comics, Pop, Culture, and Politics. You can also find t-shirts and posters on Teespring. Again, check the links below for all Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter merchandise. Oh. I'm touching myself tonight.